this morning to to call you up higher um, I'm considering this uh, parable that Jesus taught of the parable of the sower and this this parable is found in Matthew chapter 13 verses 3 through 9 because then he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sower went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no because they had no deepness of earth and when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered away and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them but other fell on good fell into good ground and brought forth fruit some in hundredfold some sixtyfold some thirtyfold who hath ears to hear let him hear so here we we have a picture of a sower going forth to sow and he has a specific purpose when he goes forth he's not just wandering here and there he's he's purposeful in his work he's going forth to sow and he does so in faith he's confident that the seed is good and that if it will but be sowed into the good ground it will bring forth fruit so his aim is to sow the seed in good ground but now in the process of sowing we see that some of the seeds fall on ground that is not so good it falls on ground that's stony thorny and hard but it it does not yet appear to be so he's not being careless or foolish when this happens he's not looking at patches of thorns and rocky places and casting the seed there he it appears to be good ground he's a faithful <laughs> sower is not going to knowingly sow where the seed cannot grow because it is the faithful sower's desire to bring forth much fruit unto God. And so this soil, it still has the appearance of being good, but the seed is going to make manifest what the condition of this ground is. <clears throat> also, we have God has spoken on how he feels about uh, sowing among thorns. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, he says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and in Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. So he told them, Do not sow among thorns. And also in Matthew 7, 6, we're told not to cast our pearls before the swine. Or It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. So the stones, they were under the ground. The thorns had not yet sprung up. So the ground still had the appearance of goodness. But the seed, when the seed comes into the, the situation here, it's going to show the true nature of the ground. <clears throat> the seed cannot bring forth fruit in this stony, thorny, and hard places because they are not conducive for supporting life. The plant even if it's allowed to grow a little, it will never reach maturity because the life will be choked out of it. It will never be able to bring forth fruit. So this parable is here to teach those who have ears to hear and eyes to see the mystery that it contains. There's a mystery contained in this parable that is designed to provoke the heart of the faithful so that they will continue and seek more they those who are confronted with a mystery of the kingdom of god those who are faithful they will not be content to be ignorant of this mystery they will press in and seek to be able to under have understanding so jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables because he was counting on it making a division on it bringing out the faithful and also showing who was not faithful those who had no interest in the truth and were only present for the bread or some were there just because they were curious about Jesus, they would go on their way content to not know these things. And their own disinterest in the truth would reveal the nature of their hearts. So Jesus, he was, he's a revealer of the hidden things. 
those who did who were not uh, who did not seek to know the mystery they were slothful this is they were slothful when it came to seeking the truth and and their hearts bore the evidence of this they had allowed the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches to come in as thorns and choke out the word so that it could not grow in them and make them fruitful unto God. They had not followed after the instruction of God. They had not broken up the fallow ground so that the seed could penetrate their hearts. They, are, they had hard, stony hearts that the seed could not penetrate. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 24, verses 30 through 34, shows a, a picture of what the slothful field looks like. As I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man." So brethren, it doesn't take much, just a little sleep, just a little slack, just a little wandering out of the way, a little rest from holding up the shield of faith and putting on the whole armor of God. And we will be in the same condition as this slothful man's field. Now, it is hard work to pull up these thorns by the roots. It's hard work to rebuild what has been broken down. It's hard work, but it has to be done, brethren. If we don't pull up these competing influences, then the seed won't find a place in us, and we won't be counted among those who are of the good ground. So, brethren, we have been given ears to hear and eyes to see these things. We've even been given a desire to see the hidden things of God. And each of us has experienced this when we examine ourselves of seeing places where there are thorns that have sprung up. And seeing places that have been broken down. But brethren, all is not lost. There's a remedy. We are blessed because we have been given the ability to see the areas that need to be shored up that need to be broken up yeah. and we've been we've even been given a fellow laborer who is who will work with us and help us to fix this uh, ground that is not conducive to life so that each part of us can be good ground that the seed can find a place in We have not been called to do this alone. As I said, Jesus has called us to come and be his yoke fellow. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So though there is much work to be done, brethren, we, it is a light work and an easy labor when it is done with Christ. It is in Christ that we receive grace to maintain good soil so that the word can germinate in our hearts and the seed can grow up into a mature tree capable of bringing forth fruit. But brethren, good soil must be maintained. It will not remain good on its own. The persistent plowing of the faithful will keep the heart soft and pliable. It will cause stones that are buried deeply to be pulled up and will keep thorns and briars from taking root in us. Those who were not content to go on their way without understanding the words of Jesus, those, yes, those who were not content to go on their way without understanding the words of Jesus, were the ones Jesus was talking to on that day when he spoke this parable. He knew that the word would make a division, would reveal the secret things of the heart, and that so no one can hide their true nature when confronted with the sword of the word of God. 
it will make a division and it will lay open what is secret, making manifest whose child you are. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Amen. So brethren, we have a responsibility as children of God to make sure that our field is kept in a condition in which the seed can grow. And of course, in speaking of the field, we're speaking of our hearts. Are our hearts soft so that the seed can penetrate it? We can live in a, we cannot do this for our fellow brethren. This is something that we have to do ourselves. We can't break up another person's field and make, and break up their fallow ground, but we can live in a manner in which we will provoke others to do this. When we speak the truth, we are sowing the seed, and then we encourage one another, and that's like watering the seed. But it is God who causes the seed to bring forth life. It is God who causes it to grow and to increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. We as the servants of God must be faithful to sow the seed and to water that which is sown whenever and wherever we have opportunity. And God, who is faithful, he will reward us for that labor. Now, we may not always have the opportunity to water the seeds that we have sown. But God, who is the one who gives life, will cause each one of his children to receive what is necessary for growth. So he will send some, if, if we can't water the seeds that we've sown, he will send someone else who can. And who better, brethren, to be in charge of these things than one who doesn't slumber or sleep? Whenever it's necessary, he's right there to provide what is needed for life. Isaiah 44, verses 2 through 4 says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they will, shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Now, in closing, I, I have a, a poem that I found here. It was written in 1892 by Reverend John B. Tabb, and it's called Earth's Tribute. It says, first the grain and then the blade, the one destroyed, the other made, then stalk and blossom, and again, the gold of newly minted grain. So life, by death the reaper cast, to earth again shall rise at last. For tis the service of the sod, to render God the things of God. Amen. And now I, I have a song that I would like to sing for you all. It was written by Michael Card, and it's called The Service of the Sod. And it was uh, mostly inspired by this text in Matthew, um, but also was inspired by this poem that I just read to you. The seed is scattered, it is sown, though it has power of its own. The sower casts it all around, it falls upon the fallow ground. The sower sows in faithful toil, some on rocky shallow soil, some eaten by the birds that swarm, some is withered, choked by thorns. The seed remains the same. With the mystery of a power it contains What produces fruit for God Is the service of the sod 
Though the kingdoms come to you, if you have ears to hear the truth, if you have eyes that you might see, you are the soul meant for the seed. The seed remains the same, with the mystery of the power it contains. What produces fruit for God is the service of the sod. The mystery of the seed remains, it is so small and self-contained, the sower need not ascertain, and though he sleeps, produces grain. Amen. Amen. And now